Welcome to Lightways at Life Astrologer with me, Anna Isabel. I'm a psychological astrologer and I'm very excited because today I have astrologer Henry Seltzer with me to talk about his book, The Tenth Planet, which is all about the astrological heiress. So welcome, Henry. Thank you so much. Nice to see you. It's been quite... Um, it was quite a start to the century with new planets being discovered and um, and also Pluto's demotion to the status of dwarf planet, which I'm sure astrologers think is hilarious, uh, the thought that Pluto could ever be dwarfed. <laughs> um, well, it's, it's more than hilarious. It's actually quite, quite an interesting intellectual opening because, you know, it's a very simple logistics uh, that takes place. I used to be a scientist and I have a familiarity with these with these things. That when I say I used to be a scientist in school, I was a physics major, I was gonna go that track and then branched off into more humanities oriented, which is today the astrology, both bridging both, you know, the scientific and the soft sciences, the humanities, understanding more about human nature, about psychology, as as you do yourself. But it, just to complete that thought, and it's a little complicated thought, but the fact that Pluto was to designate as a dwarf planet is so interesting considering that we have found over and over again before and after that uh, designation that Pluto is very important in charts. You know, there's no question that Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. And uh, this is very basic, very understood. I mean, we use it all the time. We, we understand that there's no change as far as we're concerned, astrologers are concerned, with the way we work with Pluto. And so that brings up immediately, well, what about this other one? They're calling it a dwarf planet, Eris. Uh, bigger, uh, not, not bigger, it's actually about the same diameter, but brighter and more dense, arguably the more important item in the Kuiper belt to Pluto. So just logically, just to begin with, before we do any of the research, before we confirm what I have been able to confirm that it is very important in charts, logically it would seem that it would be so indeed and so i guess we begin by talking about the astronomy behind eris and um when this planet was discovered and where it is yes well so yeah you're right about that too that's another very key uh, item in this whole thing why wasn't eris discovered alongside of pluto since it's brighter and more dense well it's further out it has a 556 year orbit and it's at the apelion or the furthest point. Uh, had we had the telescopes 250 years ago that we had in 1930s, we would have discovered Eris along with Pluto. But now that we have the telescopes, we can see that they are kind of a match for each other as far as you know their importance in the Kuiper belt and so on. So I think that's what you were getting at probably. Yes, indeed. Um, so that's quite a long time to orbit the sun. So then how many years typically does Eris spend in one particular sign? Well, you know, I'll have to preface my comments on that by saying, as we are right now, in this 21st century moment, when we have so much going on as a culture, when Western culture is, you could say, on the brink, you could say an, an inflection point in the culture. You could say pre-pandemic, post-pandemic, and uh, post-racism um, coming out in the open more. You know, I mean, there's a lot going on right now in the culture. And so to find a planet at that time means something. So right now, you, you asked about how long does it spend in each sign? To me, the most one of the most relevant things is how long does it spend in Aries? <laughs> because, you know, it entered, that's the current times. So it entered Aries in 1920, doesn't leave till 2040, so 120 years. Now, that's a lot of the 556 year orbit because of this uh, extremely elongated elliptical orbit of Eris that, you know, is at the Apelion. So much closer to the 20 years you'd expect from Pluto when it gets on the other side, which is the 250 year mark, you know, from now or before now. So that's somewhat of an answer. I mean, yeah, I, to me, it's more relevant for the current time. So if you look in the past, it's, it's less and less time per, per sign. Uh, 
towards more like Pluto, like 20. Okay, so what we're saying is that because it's it's an elliptical orbit like Pluto, it could spend longer in some signs than in others. And it's much more elliptical even than Pluto, right? Yeah. I find it very significant that it was discovered in the sign of Aries because Eris being the sister of Aries. Yes. Yeah, that's very interesting. And yet, you know, people have asked me about that. They, they say, well, we, we call it a feminine warrior. You, they say to me, you, you call it a feminine warrior energy. Uh, isn't this to do with the fact that it's an Aries now? And I say, no, <laughs> I say no for two reasons. One is because of course the mythology is speaking to the nature of the planet itself, you know, and I, I believe that feminine warrior is so close to the mythology sister of the God of war in Greek mythology. Um, and then we, we wonder about the idea of chaos because people say, well, it's a chaos thing, right? Uh, well, the name was chaos, uh, the goddess of chaos and discord. But if you think about it in the Greek times, they were trying to describe their world and chaos follows war as it does. So, you know, this is the characteristic of the planet. And then the other factor in all this is I can look back to uh, Eris and Pisces very, very easily. You know, it's not that long ago. And it still has those characteristics, the same characteristics of being a strong stand for what you deeply believe, only you deeply believe. It goes to individual um, bottom line values and principles, which I think is so fantastic uh, looking at today's world how important that is. In other words, as everybody's saying, as the both the right wing political parties and the left are saying, it's time to stand up and be counted. It's so important. It's so important to come forward now, articulate what you believe, and you know, do that in a way of trying to promote that, whether it's kindness or whether it's racism but promote what it is that you most deeply believe come out in the open. And that's the only way we're going to get, get where we need to go. So coming back to the mythology, tell yes. us about the mythology of Eris. Sure. Who well, is you Eris? know, the, here's, here's a funny thing about the mythology of Eris. So many astrologers were kind of a little bit thrown off course by this idea of the goddess of chaos and discord and rolled the golden apple into the gathering. The Judgment of Paris. This is a fragment of the mythology that comes down to us. And I've always felt, you know, that doesn't dictate the astrological archetype. You know, we have an idea from the mythology, and then we do the research to see what it really does seem to mean in charts. So to me, the most important is how can we understand it from the research? Uh, and from the mythology, though, the fact that it was the sister of the god of war, you know, and I have a quote, followed him willingly into the battle and delighted in the groans of the dying. So you, you have this kind of a bloodthirsty uh, militant side to it. And then you look at the charts of feminists from the last 200 years and they all have strong ears. I kept looking and I kept saying, well, sure, sure, sooner or later, I'm gonna find a chart of a, of a leading feminist from the last 200 years that doesn't have strong ears, but I couldn't find it. Literally, they all have strong ears, so, which makes sense because it is that same idea of a militant feminine. And then uh, to complete that thought, what is the difference between a feminine warrior and a masculine warrior, the no normal notion of a warrior, which might have to do with ego, it might have to do with power. Um, I'm bigger, I'm, I'm better, I can do this, um, you know, and, or for, mo for money or for territory. You know, it might, it might be for a number of political kind of reasons. But I feel like a feminine warrior is for deep need. And the feminists really were after what they felt to be a really, really crucial uh, value that women should be honored as men should be deciders as much as men and should have the vote, and for, for example, and should be leaders. And of course, what we're seeing now coming out with the prominence of Eris in the astrological arena is also the prominence of the woman uh, politician, the woman leader, such a, a, a rise in, in that coming along. So I think that really corresponds. And I think the word we also need to throw in there is recognition, the need for recognition to be recognized because if you're recognized, then you're counted, you, you count as something. Um, mm. 
So you, you made a reference to the apple being thrown. Um, and I think it's important that we actually tell that story for those who aren't familiar with it. Yes. Oh, okay, so I will tell that story and I'll preface it by saying, I discount this as the real meaning of it. In other words, people, astrologers, have taken it to go and run with it. You know, they said, well, this means that there's a whole thing about being left out, being resentful of that and all that. Well, that may be a minor note in the Eris archetype, but I don't believe that the astrological era type, <laughs> the astrological Eris archetype really corresponds entirely to the story. However, the story is um, the judgment of Paris. Um, there was a wedding and Eris was left out of the wedding being a little bit, you know, of a fighter, a little bit of a, of a rugged personality who wants that at a wedding, you know, not, not a proper woman. So, uh, or not a, not a demure, uh, dainty woman. So she rolls the golden apple into the gathering and it says on it, it says to the fairest. And the goddesses all begin to vie for it. They say, well, that must be me, Aphrodite says, and then also Diana and uh, Hera. Um, they, they wanted to be recognized that way um, which was that kind of a standard, you know, sort of a standard of feminine beauty being this is what we are. We're women, we're beautiful, we have that going. And Zeus, um, rather than decide, <laughs> very wisely chose somebody else to be <laughs> the one and chose Paris, who was immortal, but was somehow involved in the gathering. And then by Aphrodite, who he did decide in favor of, he was promised the most beautiful woman in the world, which was Helen of Troy, even though she was inconveniently married at the time to one of the kings of Mycenae, Mycenaean kings. And so then that was the origin of the Trojan War. The fact that he was given Helen, he kind of kidnapped her, stole her away. They were in love. They went to Troy. She's called Helen of Troy in the famous uh, saga of then what followed the Trojan War. I think there is something that actually is very relevant in that myth, because if we're talking about um, feminists um, wanting recognition, wanting to be honored, etc., mm -hmm. we cannot ignore the fact that she wasn't invited to this wedding. And I think that you could argue that by virtue of the fact that women did not have the same rights in society as men, that that was a form of exclusion from the party. And I think there is something else there that I find really interesting. We could blame Eris for the Trojan War. And of course she played her part, a very mischievous part because she knew exactly what was going to happen. But what she did when she threw that apple is she brought out something in the other women. She brought out the, that competitive um, streak, which they perhaps aren't supposed to have. So she's revealing something about their nature too. And that's what leads then to this sequence of events for which she of course gets the blame. But maybe it's, it's she saying, actually, you know what? This is something that's in all women. It's not just me, it's all of you. And I think that's really I'd relevant. Like to, I'd like to, can I interrupt one second? I agree with you hundred percent what you just said. I would say, yes, she's revealing something but she's not revealing something that's in women per se. She's revealing something that's in the whole society. Exactly. And that's exactly what I was coming to. But I, I was highlighting women particularly because they were involved in this. And also that whole vision of women, you know, and the demurity of women. And we still have this thing about women being, you know, collaborative rather than competitive. Yes. And this is a direct challenge to that perception or that that way of pre presenting what it is to be feminine. So I think that's really important. And I think as well, there's something here about demanding that we be honest about the darker side of ourselves. 
um, and, and that we be very careful about excluding others because they are different. But actually, I think particularly that this is about the projection of what is dark within onto the those we 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 turn into the other. So I think this is an incredibly important um, myth and very pertinent to our time, which is perhaps why she's been discovered at this moment in time in the sign, <laughs> the sign of Aries. Yes. Well, you make a very good point. You know, I mean, I, that is true. The reason that I uh, tend to discount it is only because uh, by by taking that and, and taking sort of a superficial view of it, I think you you did, you presented a much deeper analysis of that story of rolling the golden apple and why they went crazy. You know, because to the fairest was I mean we're all the fairest, so the excluded other is a very important part of this. And of course, as you point out, I think you more or less said here we have Eris discovered Eris coming into our awareness. Uh, the mythology of Eris coming into our awareness in the society. And we have the Me Too movement. We have women standing up for themselves uh, saying, we're not going to take it anymore. We're not going to be treated this way. We're not going to be treated as an adjunct to the male ambition. Right? So. And I agree about the excluded other. Of course, that's the other big problem we have is trying to understand how we can all be part of the same. I mean, there's, there's a lot of. You know, this also, um, I don't want to distract away from where you're going, but this, there's, a, there's two others. Haomei and Makimaki are also dwarf planets in the official uh, recognition. And I have taken that to be an important point that the ones that there's a lot of candidates out there in the Kuiper Belt and astrologers have been writing about them in very interesting ways. I don't want to discount that, but the ones that are officially named and they are four in number as far as the Kuiper Belt goes, and they are Pluto, Eris, Haumea, and Maki Maki. So I, you know, the reason I bring those up now is because, and this point of the discussion with you is because I think when you're saying, well, we found this planet and we understand that there's a lot of issues with the excluded other. There's a lot of issues with feminists rising up and saying, we want to seat at the table uh, and we don't want to be treated like objects anymore and just, uh, regarded as pretty pretty objects, pretty women, that we have to be the fairest and that's all there is to us. Um, and all those things coming along at this time. When you look at all three of these new planets, including Maki Maki and Haumea, you can see that there's actually a movement towards inclusion, towards moral compass, towards right action, right relationship, what we, what we know instinctively is the right way to behave and to be with each other. And yet somehow, we get carried away with these notions. When I say we, the, the culture itself gets carried away with these notions of patriarchy, of exclusion, of uh, trying to keep what's ours and not let anybody else get any part of it. You know, that's a little bit what's going on with some of the culture wars and stuff. So if we now move forward, because we've been looking at the mythology and its signif wider significance, in terms of psychology, but also our own, um, the time in which we live. And we take that into the personal chart. How do we understand Aries, uh, Aries, Aries? Aries. <laughs> chart. Yes, a little slip of the tongue here. How do we understand it in the chart? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Well, okay, so my, my research was uh, to begin with the idea of feminine warrior. And that just came from the mythology. And then my idea was also, what is the difference between a feminine warrior and a masculine one? Perhaps it has to do with deep principles. In other words, my concept was twofold there. Um, I used to, when I first started lecturing about Eris, I used to talk about uh, a natural act of violence that could be considered you know, for example, if a tiger kills a deer in the woods and drags the deer back to its cubs, we don't say bad tiger. You know, we say that's an act of violence that comes from a natural purpose. There's a, there's a reason for it. It's not a, a wanton killing. In other words, if we say 
all these people are murdering all these animals just for sport, we might say bad, bad people. But in the nature, you know, when it's for a reason, when it's for a deep reason, I would also give the example of a woman, a mother, a child with her, and she's got a knife in her hand because she's cutting up the food and there's an intruder and there's suddenly a threat. It might be a threat to her child's life. She might use that knife. This doesn't mean she's a bloodthirsty woman that runs around knifing people. It means more that she's the, the violence is rising is arising for a particular purpose. So those are just a little two little aphorisms. But um, when I started looking at it, I understood much better because I looked and I looked and I looked at all these charts. And what you find is you find that Eris really does go to depth within the psyche just as Pluto does. So we understand that uh, the planets as we, as we come to understand them, including the outer planets, go to further uh, aspects of psychology. They go to, the, as, as Jung pointed out, as Freud and Jung pointed out in the beginning of the, of the 20th century, there's a lot of depth to the unconscious that we are just beginning to understand with, with the rise of these new planets, including Pluto, and then now Eris. And understanding that um, our deepest principles are there for us to, to dive into and to discover and then to bring forward. And so it's more of an integration with the depth. Um, and so for example, um, the house that Eris occupies in any natal chart, it turns out to be an important house simply from the presence of Eris. And so I wrote these little 12 descriptions of what that house might mean if you really considered it from a depth standpoint. And this is my bottom line. This is what I really respond to what I'm involved in. And they were so popular. People uh, always saw these little paragraphs that come out of the Time Passage of Software or they come out in the book. I have a cookbook section, as you saw, probably. So um, yes, those have been like so recognized. I can't think of anybody that said, oh, that's not me. And in one particular case, um, a very well-known uh, psychological astrologer looked at that and said, how did you do that? You touched my soul. So I took that as a, as a nice compliment. But, you know, basically, um, I think I understand the archetype for some reason pretty well. Um, and not only is the house position really significant in charts, and it will be like an important house for you, an important uh, set of values and a set of, you know, place where you work and, and you know, an area of life that is significant to you. Did you look at yours, by the way? You must have. Yeah, I did. <laughs> did, did you like what you saw there? <laughs> Don't know your yep. chart. It's, um, well, I, I think given that it's in the eighth house and what it is that I do, it's not exactly, <laughs> it didn't exactly. It does, kind of fits, it. yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I see that in, in uh, client work all the time. And I say, oh, you could be, you could be a psychologist. And sometimes they say, well, that's what I studied at school. Or sometimes they say, yeah, I've always yeah. wanted to do that. But anyway, um, yes, the eighth house, of course, is the intimate connection with others. And to going to depth, the water houses all go to depth. Anyway, um, so yes, good good point there. I mean, <laughs> good little quick little <laughs> example point with you. But um, so the other thing that I want to mention right away though is what I also found, which is fascinating, is that you have a depth connection uh, as far as the as aspects between with some other planet. If it's an inner planet or mostly the inner planets is so fascinating. Eris with Mercury, they're a writer. It's really almost invariable. I mean, and the other works the other way. Like I had dinner. Um, I was in London. You know, I went to the AA conference in London, and uh, I had, happened to be a guy at dinner who said, "Yeah, I'm, I'm a writer." And I said, "Well, you probably have Eris with Mercury." And then he, of course, he did. You know, so um, it, it's fascinating, and it's not just Mercury. So Eris with the Moon is very interesting. Mm. Eris with the Sun is very interesting. You have Eris with the Moon. <laughs> No, I don't. But I just thought, yeah, with the moon, I should imagine, given, you know, the everything that we've been talking about as regards the myth. Yeah. Well, if, if I start with your, let me start with yours. Eris with the sun is oftentimes these feminist leaders like um, Gloria Steinem has the conjunction, your sun conjunction. And, you know, that it really comes into um, just being a, a strong person, a strong uh, leader, you know, a feminine, a feminist leader or just a, a female who is a strong leader. And um, you might expect that, you know, and it just shows up pretty well. It's somebody that's strong in their opinions about what needs to happen, you know. I say it also is if you connect with what's deep inside and that's your real 
goal, you know, that's what really, really drives you, then you're unstoppable. Uh, you can fool around because you don't understand what's deep inside you or you don't have a connection with that that, you know, enables you to articulate it for whatever reason. And that is a little bit more problematic. You know, it could be for a different, come out differently. It could come out as just kind of this um, random um, willpower that, that doesn't really work as well, you know, if, if it's not connected to the depth of, of within you. But with the moon, what I find is that it's kind of seeing things from a different angle. It's not that same logical Apollonian reasoning of rationality. Um, and you see it with paradigm shifters. You see it with Copernicus. You see it with Newton. You see it with Einstein. Uh, you see it with Jung. All had strong Eris moon connections. And Jung, I mean, uh, Einstein, for example, had a square, uh, I think a partile square. And, uh, you know, what he, what he says about his work, you know, he, he had all these um, visions of how uh, to describe these new ideas in, in physics that he was, that he came up with. And he, they would be like sort of word, um, uh, what I'm trying to say is, uh, these, these ideas in terms of almost pictures, you know, like chasing a light beam. What would happen if you were chasing a beam of light? And what he said, the quote is, he said, all of my discoveries have never been made from the standpoint of a rational approach. And so it's interesting. And then I see it over and over again. So Iris with the moon has that kind of unusual character of just seeing things from a different angle, being willing to go against the grain. Um, and that's typical to going against the grain. The reason that I was so interested, you know, about the connection with um, or the combination of moon and Eris is because Eris is pure instinct, isn't she? And, and the moon is exactly what is instinctual in us. So I can imagine that combination would mm. really be very strong in terms of intuition. Yes, good point. Just um, a thought, because, you know, we talk about rulerships and um, Pluto, you know, having been assigned to Scorpio, etc. To me, it feels very natural to have Eris in Aries, um, at, or Eris as the as a co ruler for Aries. But I guess maybe the real question I'm asking is, we can think about outer planets um, symbolizing a kind of higher octane of some of the personal planets. So Venus, Neptune, instance yes my my own instinct would be to say that eris is representing a sort of higher octane of mars how do you feel about that i feel mixed um you know um there is a warlike character to it so that does make sense from the standpoint of archetypes um on the other hand um you know, she's a feminine warrior. So that's a little different. So in other words, I think Mars, if you take it to a higher octave, you could, you could maybe say, um, you could almost say Pluto, you know, because there is a kind of a, it's, I guess it's the masculine side of it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so that, and people have also said, by the way, Libra, and that doesn't make sense to me because here Libra is very balanced and Eris is very like demanding and they're going to do it my way, you know. So I, I don't see it with Libra so much, although um, there is the feminine, you know, the fact that. So I, I see it as, um, you know, there's a connection to, to Venus really, too, because of the feminine side of it. You know, it's a, definitely a goddess rather than a god or a feminine quality to it. So to her, <laughs> I like to use the uh, masculine and feminine pronouns with, with planets because I think it brings out that they are almost like these in individual independent powers of nature that we, we really have, you know, that's, as the Greeks described, you know, we have these, these parts inside us. I guess my reasoning was that in the alchemical sense of having the union of the masculine and feminine, um, for a higher function, if you like. Mm. To me, thinking about, because already Mars, in a way, is a more directed energy than Aries, the mythological god, was, because Aries was just pure rage. 
Okay. And, and Mars is not pure rage. Mars is is a warrior with a purpose. It's not the berserker kind of energy of, of well, area. I would, say, I would say even for the Greeks, though, just, just for one second to just qualify that a little bit, even for the Greeks, the warrior was not um, all bad. You know, they, there was the rage, but they did understand that that was a necessary function, that we had to exactly. have that. And we had to bring that energy forward in order to be able to do things. You know, there's a way that it is about doing. Well. And then if we if we take that Mars, you know, that more developed Mars energy, if you like. Yes. And, and we think of the feminine quality of Eris. Yes, and, we bring, that together. and we bring the two together. To me, that is a more refined energy because it's about having a just cause mm -hmm. it's yes absolutely it's it's not just about being a soldier because being a soldier or a warrior you could be a mercenary that's right but this is something else and that's it why i'm else. thinking in terms of a, a higher and and can i bring in also um you know the alchemists were all about the conjunctio right which that's is bringing the feminine about. Well, that was mm -hmm. what you're gonna say <laughs> yeah and so, exactly. and so, you know, in a way, this is also an evolutionary um, signpost, you know, an evolutionary milestone for, a cult, for our culture. Our culture, if you think about it, um, has evolved psychologically uh, greatly during the 20th century. I mean, there was, before Jung, Jung and Freud, not much of an understanding of the unconscious, right? And then as we progress through the 20th century, I think of the 50s, and then I think of the 60s and the 70s. And to me, it's night and day. We didn't understand anything in the 50s as a, as a general broad culture. I mean, there was, of course, people that did understand. But, you know, it, it's progressed so far uh, from, from when uh, that started, you know, when, when, when we were in that state of, you know, almost denial of anything meaningful. You know, it was just all about the results, you know, the, the outside, the outer. Uh, anyway, I think we've come a long way, but I think in this 21st century, we've come further um, and the, the, the seed is there to, to go to really further, to really understand an integration that we, could, that we could find within ourselves, you know, and I think it's necessary. And it's also shown to be so necessary by this huge division we have now in our society. Um, you know, between almost people that want to hark back to the 60s to let's give peace a chance. You know, let's let love and kindness be our, our motto and somehow get along that way and maybe make the world a paradise on earth. And then there's these other people know you've got to defend your territory. You've got to exclude the other, as you were mentioning at the very beginning. So I, I really think we're on this crossroads right now as a culture. And I think Iris comes along and really brings us to this idea that there is the possibility, as Jung brought forward, of a, of a deep integration within our soul, within our consciousness of what is really real. And I, I could go on and on about this because- Indeed. Others, yeah, go ahead. We come back to the fact that in order to achieve that, we have to first of all understand our own capacity for discord rather than just thinking it's the other. And, well, and I think that, that's a very important aspect very of, good. That's true. of what she has to, to offer. So we've, we've, we've touched a little bit on the aspects um, and I bet loads of people watching are thinking, what about transits? <laughs> what, what can I expect from a, an heiress transit? I'll give you two examples of transits. One is, um, I just, this is a very funny story because I just almost randomly grabbed Einstein as an example chart because I wanted to, let's look at how it comes. I didn't think about transit so much with him, but um, I, I, I can't explain it exactly, but chapter three of, of the book, I, I wanted a feminist example and also a, a more masculine one. I just grabbed Einstein because he did have this strong square to the moon and. Anyway, um, 
So Einstein was born with Eris almost the very top of the chart, very close to his midheaven, but also he has the sun only eight and a half degrees away in the 10th house with Eris uh, before the sun. So the fact that Eris is near the very top of the chart, that's the outer persona, the recognition, the fame in the world. And of course, Einstein became literally the most recognized scientist in the world. You know, that very familiar outline of, of his face, the shock of the wild hair. It was just like, that was the iconic scientist, the mad scientist, right? And then uh, Eris got closer and closer to his sun degree as he was going through his youth. And so um, I found that 1905, when I was looking at the transits, was the year of Eris on his sun. Now, it, it did contact his sun before that, then backed away, contacted again, backed away, contacted in February of 1905, went past and then backed, backed up to his sun and stationed on his sun degree to the minute. And so I said, well, this is the year, 1905 is the year of his Eris on his sun degree. Then I go to the biography. 1905 in the biography of Einstein is called his Annus Mirabilis, his miracle year when he overturned the foundations of modern physics with five papers, including, I think, a thesis. But uh, he, the, Brown, the um, Brownian motion, um, the photoelectric effect, which he won the Nobel Prize for, and the beginnings of the theory of relativity, I don't know, E equals MC squared. All of that was in 1905. And uh, a, a degree before that was around uh, 19, I mean, sorry, 1899, when he was first beginning to write uh, letters about relativity theory. And a degree after that, he was no longer working the patent office in the Swiss patent office, but was a professor of physics at Bern University. So that's a transit of years to his natal son. Um, and there's a few others I could give. I mean, one is, um, when I st first started looking at women who run with the wolves, you know, I mean, as soon as I saw that book, I said, Iris. And of course she does have strong Iris, but more particularly as far as the writing goes, she had Iris on her Mercury during the time of first conceiving that book, starting, it started with a lot of lectures and things where she was just talking about it in excerpts before the book actually came out. But you look at the period of time when Iris was on, on her Mercury, I forget it was a trine or something like that. So um, that's two examples. And then I actually have a really nice one. Um, it involves Haumea. Now, can we talk about these other two a little bit? Yeah, of course, yes. <laughs> and I'll just, I'll just at least introduce it this way. So Haumea and Makimaki seem to have to do with a profound connection to nature. That's what I found. And connection to nature that also involves concepts of natural law, right? Right action, right relationship, internal moral compass. Uh, issues of both environmental activism, but also social justice come along more with Maki Maki, which is more the activist of the two and how is more like the tree hugger just loves nature and has that natural, there's a natural charisma that comes. And you, can, you find them in sort of just good people, people that you say, boy, that's a really good person's always telling the truth and just really on, ta on target, you know, doing the right thing, not not fooling around with it, not being so in, obsessed with uh, status or money or whatever. Anyway, um, so when I was looking at John Muir, which is of course something you really wanna look at if you're talking about profound connection to nature, he was like an iconic uh, describer of nature. He was fundamental in creating some of the natural, like uh, Yosemite was, was his, you know, he urged the national park and helped in the creation of it. Anyway, um, it turns out he had an industrial accident he was working as a foreman. He was not primarily um, involved with, with nature, but he was working, he was very smart, um, very good in school, with, very good with his hands, very good mechanically. And he was working as a foreman in a factory that made broom handles and things like that. And he was working with a belt. And in those days, this is back in, I think, uh, he was just before he was 30 years old. So I think it was, 1870s, I think. I think that's right. Anyway, he's working with a belt that they just had these leather belts that were sewn together. You know, so he was he was taking it apart to probably add to it or, or something or replace it. Anyway, he was working with a file and he was digging into the stitches to get the stitches out, plunged the file deep into his eye, mm -hmm. slipped off the stitches. 
um, and both eyes lost sight because of a sort of sympathetic blindness. And he was told you have to, you probably won't ever regain your sight, but you might anyway, you have to be in the dark for six weeks, which he, he did, no, no light. And he came out of that with vision in both his eyes. His eye recovered, he could see, there's nothing wrong with his sight his whole life. And he dropped his uh, tasks that he was engaged in as far as the world and decided that he would use that opportunity to see nature and see nothing but nature. And he went on his famous thousand mile walk where he was also a botanist that was cataloging plants that he found, you know, and eventually went to California, Yosemite became his like golden place, you know, and he would just disappear into the into nature for a week at a time or something like that. But anyway, he became eventually very, very well known as a naturalist, had better ideas about the glaciers and, and how the glaciers were formed and how or how how they how they created certain val valleys and things, how the glaciers were part of the whole. He had that theory before any other scientist. And anyway, um, when you look at the at the timing of that industrial accident that started the whole thing, Haumea was partile conjunct his son. And it was also triggered by the position of the sun in the sky, which was like sextile, I think, or something like that. There was a couple of other transits. You, you'd want some other timing because of course it's it moves so slowly, but it doesn't move quite as slowly as Eris, but they move about as slowly as Pluto through, through uh, signs. Anyway, I just thought that was beautiful because here that changed his life. Mm -hmm. And here it was, how may I on his son degree partile. Going back to Eris, sure. the, the other question that occurred to me as we've been speaking is because you've, we've been talking about her, you know, in female charts, etc., and you've talked about Einstein yes. um, as, as an example, of course, of man. Is there a difference between how she's experienced by men and how she's experienced by women? Well, you know, it's interesting too with Einstein having ears with the moon. Um, you know about the quotes. I mean, there's so many. He's 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 kind of a, a he was a, a, he did play the violin. He was never without a female companion his whole life. He was starting with 18 when he was a student, and he had a, a friend, uh, this close connection to, with the daughter of the family he was staying with. Um, so you know, you find a lot of feminine. Um, I think that there's a certain kind of feminine consciousness in the, you know, the quotes are amazing. Um, like, uh, you cannot get out of the problem with the same um, information you used to get into it. You have to come from a different angle, you know, he says. And, oh, he said, uh, if, if a person is driving a car and also kissing his, a girl, he's not giving the kiss the attention it deserves. You know, things like that. So he's got this beautiful side to him, which is almost a feminine side, you could say, you know, and you see that with a strong moon too in, in natal charts, of course. Um, you know, then there's um, how do you be a strong leader and a woman who's got a lot to do and to create and to be recognized for and not give up on your femininity? You know, you have that kind of a thing that, that goes on. Um, Robert Redford had strong iris, and he's a masculine person, a personality, you know, that it doesn't mean that he's going to be a feminine type, you know, he's a masculine type, but it's just, it's a, it's a consciousness that goes beyond those simple patriarchal kind of things of I'm, I'm the boss because I'm a little stronger and I can, I can exercise that kind of cultural advantage. It, it kind of goes beyond that. I mean, with, with, I think there's a, I, I would say there's a recognition with strong iris in men of that that's okay to be feminist. It's okay to have women that are strong, you know? Um, yeah, maybe, maybe what we're talking about is the integration of the masculine and feminine within the, um, within the individual, irrespective of which sex they belong to. And as we're discovering now, irrespective of even physical uh, determination of gender. So what is, you talked about the 
the conjunctions, uh, or um, no, was, was it a conjunction? Yes, it was a conjunction when you were talking about Einstein in terms of a transit. Um, in terms of challenging transits from Eris, um, I'm not sure that we would be looking at such miraculous years. Okay. Well, yeah, that was a great example, of course. Uh, like I, I stumbled into it, basically. But um, uh, here's another one. Um, well, that was an opposition. But it was an opposition with um, the transiting Neptune Eris midpoint directly opposite the sun. It's Herman Melville during the writing of Moby Dick, with, of course, Neptune being the ocean. So, I mean, you know, it, it's, it's a way of kind of describing finding your, your soul intention, you know, finding what is your work, what, what are you supposed to be doing, you know? And anytime it goes with, the, for all the outer planets, anytime you have a transiting outer planet, it brings out where is that in your natal chart? Where is the outer planet happening, you know? So in general, uh, you would look to Eris in your natal and then see how does that connect? How does that land in, in terms of uh, the house position? And just think about that, you know, what is, what is the fuller, um, application of that, which you could think about when you're not having an nearest transit, but you tend to think of it more when you are. Right? Um, so the, I think it's a, it's a real clue in the natal positions. It's a real clue to what am I supposed to be doing? What am I, what's my forte? You know, where, where am I supposed to plug in? Because I do think, and that's something that we really need to know, that a lot of people don't know that that are outside of the study of astrology. They don't realize that there is such a thing as what am I here for? There is such a thing as soul intention, you know? And I think it's a beautiful thing to tune into that. And it really kind of frees you up too, because you don't have to feel like you're um, just, you know, caught in the maelstrom, you know, just a, a, a chip in the, in the flooding waters and what, how can you make a difference? Because you can, you can actually make a difference by finding what it is that you're supposed to be up to and doing, acting in that direction. And I guess maybe with Eris, you know, it's the, it's also about, you know, that, that passion that drives your sense of purpose, because it's, it's what you believe in with your conviction, you know, that turns you into a, somebody who's a strong advocate for what you are, you are doing. And we can use the word warrior without it. And in this case, I don't mean warrior as in you're going to war as such, but certainly having the passion of the warrior to yes. go out into the world and forge a path um, according to your, your beliefs, um, which hopefully have a, a higher intention. Um, otherwise, I suppose we should all get out of the way. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's true. When, you, when, you're on your, when you're on your path, you know, it is, it is a warrior and, and it is for good purpose, you know. <laughs> Exactly. You are on your higher purpose. There is no nothing to, to fear. It is going to be the highest intention. So I think um, this is all wonderful um, food for thought. And for those who would like to um, learn more, and I urge you to do so, um, the book that we are talking about is The Tenth Planet, Revelations from the Astrological Heiress. And I'll uh, put a link um, to that. On, oh, I was going to do the same on thing. The description box. Yes. <laughs> um, Isn't that a great cover, by the way? That's, I, I it's love a the cover. cover. I love it. Yeah, we try to get to the depths of things. And, uh, you know, the symbol that uh, my son and I created for Eris, that's the astrological symbol that's been recognized now. Yes, it's, it's wonderful. So um, the link will be there on the description box. And if people wanted to find you, Henry, how do they do that? Well, a couple of things. One is my website is astrograph.com. Uh, A-S-T-R-O-G-R-A-P-H means astrological writing. We have a lot of um, things for people's sun sign. You know, we do a monthly column on there. And I also have gotten several articles out um, in the Mountain Astrology. Lately, I've been concentrating on these other two as well as Eris. And so there's actually another book, if I can show it, which is uh, a book that just came out and it's actually ephemeris of all the positions for these planets for Pluto as well. All the dwarf planets that are in the Kuiper belt that are designated as planets. So it's, it's uh, Pluto, it's four columns, it's Eris uh, and, and Haumea Makimaki along with Pluto. 
and there's an introduction by me, <laughs> which is um, you know a few example charts trying to just summarize and articulate that the, the sense I have of the archetypes of all three. So that's I'm very proud of that book. It just came out uh, from ACS Publications, the Ephemeris people, and it's uh, got not only the positions but also a little bit of description of what they mean and how you can start to think about them in your own chart. Fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us. I'll be sure to put that information on the, the, the description box as well. Thank you, Henry. Yes, thank you. Nice to talk to you. And thank you all for watching. And if you haven't already, please remember to subscribe. If you have any comments or questions, do feel free to make them, ask them. I always read and I always reply. Until next time, goodbye. <laughs>